thank you everybody for joining. Um, as he said, my name is Rob Aldinger. I'm the National Specification Manager for Precision Pumping Systems, where I have been employed now for a little over 25 years. Um, as you can see, we're out of Boise, Idaho, and at the bottom of my screen there, I put a map of where Boise, Idaho is located because I want everybody to clear that this is not Ohio and it's not Iowa. We're actually in Boise, Idaho, which is in the Pacific Northwest. So um, anyway, without further ado, I want to um, I want to proceed with talking about uh, a lot of the new modern technology that goes into pumping systems. Um, and we're going to start this out. It's going to look a little bit like a uh, probably a very basic uh, pump training session. But I believe that we're going to go through a process here that's going to give you a better idea of how the modern technology works with the pump because there's some graphics in here, et cetera, I think that help out with that. Oftentimes we talk about VFDs and various things. And, and I think that maybe, you know, we, we kind of cross the board, understand the application a little bit. I'm hoping that this will make the application even a little bit clearer as to uh, how that works and, and why it works and why it's important. So I'm um, going to move forward. So the centrifugal pumps, the most common method of pumping water in the, in the world, um, centrifugal pump uses a single uses an impeller to move the water. Through centrifugal force, the pump converts energy to a variable combination of pressure and flow. Since since the uh, combination of of uh, pressure and flow are variable, when flow increases, pressure must decrease, and vice versa. That's important to understand here because what we're looking at here at the bottom of the screen is what's known as the pump curve. And if you're in the pump world, that's the most important thing there is to you. So we talk about pump curves a lot. I think in some cases people fully understand that. In other cases, people aren't really sure what it's all about. And hopefully when we get done here, we'll have a better idea. It's relatively simple and it is very important when it comes to pump selection. So the centrifugal pump impeller in order for it to work, there must be water available at the center of the eye of the impeller. If, if, it's, if there's no water available and the pump is spinning, no water will pump. This will be, this is what's known as the pump having lost prime. Uh, we hear that term a lot and sometimes I'm not sure if people are entirely clear on what that means. So as the impeller spins, water is forced outward. Impeller di diameter, rotational speed, and vane width all affect the, outwit, the output of the pump. So that's the impeller diameter. The RPM is the rotational speed and the vane width. So every, every impeller that's ever been designed is designed around a specific output utilizing those three factors. Spinning impeller, impeller forces the fluid outward. This creates a low pressure center at the eye of the impeller. If the pressure at the eye of the impeller is lower than the atmospheric pressure, atmospheric pressure will force fluid into the eye. So what we're talking about here is, you know, there's an old, uh, if you're a pump geek, there's an old jokes that says pumps, pumps don't suck. And the reality is they do not suck. When a pump is spinning, it is actually the, the atmospheric pressure and possible head pressure of, of an elevated water source that's forcing water into that impeller. It's the most common pump in the world, the in-suction centrifugal pump. There's the impeller. The impeller is located inside the volute so that the water and the pressure is contained in there. There's the motor. There's the shaft. As the impeller spins, it forces water outward, which draws water inward. Now, one of the reasons that I put this slide in here, because it's, I think it's very important to note that um, the pump, which is this portion of the device, and the motor, which is this portion of the device, are two entirely separate things, and they're made by separate manufacturers. So the pump manufacturers design and build all of the, uh, what's known as the pump end or the water end or the wet end, and then they find a, a pump that somebody else manufactures to mate with their pump via the shaft in order to, uh, in order to energize the pump. So in section centrifugal pumps are typically used for suction lift applications and pressure boost applications. 
here's some typical examples of uh, of end suction pump stations. So the pump curve, and this is, uh, I, I think, an important thing to see is that the pump curve is a graphic showing the results of the manufacturer's pump test. So every manufacturer develops a an impeller of one size or another with the various uh, um, uh, things that we talked about earlier, and then they and they've already got a design, they've already got a, a range in mind when they do that, and then they test it. How do they do that? The pump operates at a fixed speed. So if you remember our three criteria for designing an impeller, we're we're, we're talking about the uh, rotational speed, the RPM. So they're going to pump that, or the, that they're going to operate that impeller at a fixed speed, and then they're just going to open a valve slowly. And as the water's flowing through that valve, the more they open it, the more pre the pressure drops against that pump and points are plotted as the flow increases. So as you can see, as the flow increases, the pressure drops. That's this particular pump intended pump's operating range right there. If, if, it does, if what you're looking for doesn't fit in that operating range, then you should probably be looking at a different pump. Well, you shouldn't probably, you should definitely be looking at a different pump at that point, okay? So now we're gonna talk about the impeller diameter a little bit. And what I wanna show you is the effect that the trimming or the reducing of the impeller diameter has on a pump. So in this particular application, we're looking at a pump that's 5,000 gallons a minute. So uh, you know, everything that we talk about here is going to apply to pumps that are one gallon a minute or many, many thousands of gallons a minute. The application is the same in every case. So in this particular case, we have a design point of 5,000 gallons a minute at 100 PSI. So that particular pump is designed to pump exactly that at exactly that point. It's an it's 11.25 inch diameter impeller in this case. Now we want a 2,500 gallon a minute at 100 PSI flow. So if we reduce that impeller size to 10 inch instead of 11.25 inches, that, that same pump now pumps 2,500 gallons a minute at 100 PSI. I'm gonna talk now about uh, a couple of different types of pumps and how they operate. And again, this is, this is pertinent by the time we're done here. Um, so bear with me. So when pumps are pumping in series, that means an impeller pumps into another impeller and possibly into an another and another. And every time that it, that happens, it's moving exactly the same amount of water, but it's increasing the pressure. So you can see as it passes through the second impeller, we've gone from 50 PSI to 100 PSI. We're still at 100 gallons a minute. And then when we leave this particular pump scenario, we're 100 gallons a minute, 150 PSI. So a vertical turbine pump is a pump that's designed to pump in series. So it's one pump with multiple impellers. With a vertical turbine pump, the, the impellers are submerged underwater, and there's a shaft that runs to the motor. Again, the motor and the pump are two different things. The motor is above the water. Um, this is, a, this is a, a good application for when the water is deeper than when a suction lift is possible. So the water is drawn into the bottom of the pump. And again, we have 100 PSI through that impeller at 50, or 100 gallons a minute at 50 PSI through that impeller. 100 gallons a minute, 100 PSI through that impeller. And 100 gallons a minute, 150 PSI as it leaves the pump. This is a submersible turbine pump. Submersible turbine pumps are essentially the same device as, an, as, as a vertical turbine pump, except for the motor itself is actually submerged underwater. And rather being above the pump, the motor is under the pump. There's a shaft between the pump and, and the motor. And then the suction is located in the center of that. And the water is pumped up and out of uh, whatever body of water that it's located in. So now we're gonna talk about pumps that pump in parallel. So when individual pumps 
pump into a common pipe, the result is the opposite of when they pump in series. Each pump adds capacity, but the pressure remains constant. So the first pump pumps 100 gallons a minute at 50 PSI into that manifold. When the second pump comes on, it also pumps 100 gallons a minute at 50 PSI in that manifold. When the third pump comes on, 100 gallons a minute at 50 PSI, this could go on indefinitely really. And the output then into your system is 300 gallons a minute at 50 PSI. Staging the pumps in a parallel configuration so that each pump only produces part of the overall um, capacity of the pump. And of course, in order for this to happen, multiple pumps are required. So this is a vertical turbine pump with pumps in parallel right here. So you can see that we have the, um, we have the suction of the pump coming into each individual pump. And as each individual pumps, pumps into this manifold, each pump is gonna provide the same amount of pressure and each pump is gonna add capacity. So now we're gonna switch gears a little bit and we're going to talk about what happens with rotational speed rather than impeller diameter. And if you look at what we have here, you can see that the effect of changing the speed of the pump is really exactly the same as the effect of reducing the impeller size. At 5,000 gallons a minute, we're at 1,770 RPM, which is full speed, which is what this particular pump was designed for. I want you to note something down here. The horsepower utilized with this pump at 5,000 gallons a minute at 100 PSI is 347 horsepower. Now our demand has lowered out in the field somewhere, and now we only need 2,500 gallons a minute at 100 PSI. Now our speed has slowed down to 630 RPM. We got our 2,500 gallons a minute at 100 PSI. And note that we've gone from 347 horsepower being used to 225 horsepower. We're still using the same pump. Now our demand has dropped all the way to 100 gallons a minute at 100 PSI from 5,000 gallons a minute. Note that at 100 gallons a minute, we are running at 1,330 or 1,380 RPMs rather than 1,700. And we're only utilizing 150 horsepower. So I, I think that you've noticed that as the pump slows down and the capacity slows down that, uh, or that the capacity is reduced, that we're utilizing less horsepower. So what we're looking at here is actually the variable speed curve. So what happens with the, when you use variable speed to control a pump as demand changes on that pump, we don't see the pump, we, we don't see curves anymore. What we actually see is the pump maintaining a constant pressure over the entire range of the flow demand in this particular application. In most irrigation and most potable water delivery applications, um, we want that pressure to remain the same over the entire uh, flow range or the entire possible demand range because what, what will happen otherwise is at 2,500 gallons a minute, if it's at full speed, you'll see that our pressure is higher than we want it to be. And at 100 gallons a minute, it's significantly higher than we want it to be. But also, again, this, if, if the question is asked, how does a VFD save, how does variable speed slash VFD save um, energy as your demand is reduced, your, um, your energy usage is reduced as well. So I put this slide up here because it's everything that we just saw happening there all at once. The point being in a modern, um, in a modern pumping system, there's a lot going on and it's very complicated and it's a very difficult thing to control. Uh, and fortunately in the 21st, 20, is that what, we're in the 21st century now, um, <laughs> that you know, we have a lot of, of, of good technology that can control all of this automatically for smooth and efficient operation. I'm gonna pause again for questions. Any questions out there? How do you determine the minimum depth that the top impeller should be below water level to prevent cavitation? Every pump um, that you're going to select, there, there should be an associated uh, minimum submergence um, that goes along with that pump. So, so every pump is different and it has to do with, uh, uh, you know, the amount of water that it's being pumped and, and the size of the suction of the pump. So, so uh, and, and, and what's more important really with submergence than cavitation is going to be vortexing, meaning that the, if the velocity 
of the water being drawn into that pump is high enough, it'll create a vortex and start to pull air from, uh, you know, from the water surface and down into the pump. And then, then we have our cavitation. Um, so what we want to avoid really is, is having velocity or having the water too close to the suction of the pump so that um, it creates a vortex which draws water into the system. Uh, it, again, every pump, because of its capacity and its performance is different, will have minimum sub submergent requirements um, uh, available to you. And that's really how we, uh, how we arrive at that. Next question. Okay. Is one of the two, the vertical or submersible, more efficient in gallons pumped per amp drawn? Uh, I, you know, I would say, and that's a good question, and, and maybe one that I don't have a fully clear answer to. But uh, uh, it, 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 the, the vertical turbine, the vertical turbine hollow shaft motors tend to be slightly more efficient than the uh, submersible motors. Submersible motors were designed to, uh, you know, to go down inside of well casing. So I don't think that, um, you know. So, so the criteria for the design was based more around getting in, getting it into the well casing than, you know, than maximum efficiency. So I believe that you lose just a little bit of efficiency if you use a submersible turbine motor versus a, a, a vertical hollow shaft motor. I think that that efficiency is probably relatively insignificant, though. What kind of instances would you not want a VFD? Well, uh, you know, the VFDs. Just by the just by virtue of the smoothness of the operation that they um, that they provide are you know, useful in a lot of applications, even the simplest of applications. Having said that, you know here are we about the only application where we will not consider or, or not um, really even recommend a VFD being used is if we're if if the pump is filling a tank or a reservoir or something where the um, where the level drops, the pump turns on, and then it's a long time before the, you know, before the level is full, and then the pump turns off. You're not going to gain anything at that point from from using a VFD other than the soft starting of the pump rather than the hard starting of the pump. Um, and as you can see from from the chart we have here, if you're always operating at 5,000 gallons a minute or whatever it is at whatever psi, your horsepower is not changing, so you're not going to get really um, any energy benefits with exception again of soft starting, which we're gonna talk about in a little bit. Throughout the 25 years of doing what I do, I've talked about pump controls to a lot of people. Um, and I've noticed along the way that maybe sometimes I'm talking about controls and some of the people that I'm talking to don't necessarily know what it is that I'm talking about. So I'm gonna go through a few of the basic ways to uh, turn things on and off as it says here. And this is the most simple way of all to do it right here, right? We do it all every day. This is a manual closing of a full voltage circuit where when you put your finger on that light switch, you are actually making the connection on the other side of that light switch. And, and obviously when you push that plug, the same thing is happening. Motors are typically started by a magnetic contactor and the magnetic contactor is closed by a lower voltage magnet to start, the mo to start a motor at full speed. Switch closes a low voltage contact, which energizes a magnet. This eliminates the risk of electrocution. Typically, when we're when we're starting motors, pumps, etc., you know, we're dealing with higher voltage and higher amperage than we would be if we're turning on and off a light. So this separates the separates the uh, uh, user from the closing of that circuit and and eliminates the risk of electrocution. I bring this particular slide up here, this particular picture, because on almost every um, pump panel you're ever going to encounter, there's going to be a device that's known as an HOA or a hand off auto switch. Turning that hand off auto switch to hand means you have literally overridden all of the automation in that system. You are now completely in control. If there are any safeties in there, nothing is going to function. And the uh, the pump is going to run, 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 no matter whether there's some place for the water to go or not, and that could burn the pump up. The reason that I bring this up is because oftentimes people will see that a pump is not working properly, which probably means that there's been a fault or something and it's shut down for a reason, and they turn it to hand and ta-da, the pump is working. 
And then shortly thereafter, they burn the pump up or they blow pipes up, et cetera. So I always want to make sure that everybody knows if you see that handoff auto switch, unless you're a pump technician who knows exactly what you're doing when, you, when, you're, when you're dealing with that, I would recommend that you probably never turn that to hand. The magnetic contactor, when it turns on, pump comes on at full speed or it stops. It's all or nothing. Methods of starting and stopping pumps automatically. An on-off timer turns the pump on or off at timed intervals. Again, two speeds, all or nothing. Remote start. Uh, we see this a lot in the irrigation industry where we have a pump start relay and an irrigation controller. Pump is turned on or off by an irrigation controller or another device. And I say it again, two speeds, full speed or stopped, all or nothing. So the next device that's been used for a long time to start and stop pumps is a pressure switch. So what the pressure switch does is when, there, when the, the pressure in, in the pipeline hits a particular low level, the pump turns on. Then it pumps until it hits a set high level that in, in, in this case that we've set mechanically on this device, and then it turns off. Uh, so this is a way for any time that the sprinkler zone turns on or whatever out in the field, as soon as that happens, if there's pressure in the main line, the pressure drops, pump turns on. When you turn that off, pump turns off because the pressure increases to a certain point. The problem with that is, again, two speeds, all or nothing. What happens typically is your, your main line, your pipe, et cetera, may have some leakage or their, you know, whatever device you've turned on, the, the, the demand on that is only a fraction of the overall capacity of the pump and the pump turns on and turns off. And if you have, you know, and if that's left to go uh, for a period of time, it does what's called short cycling. When it short cycles, it means it turns on, turns off, turns on, turns off very quickly. And that's the most uh, damaging thing that you can do to a pump and motor. And typically what will happen when you do that is that you will have a pump and motor, pump and or motor damaged and destroyed within a very short period of time. One of the things that they've done over time with that is added timers so that you can shorten that cycle. Uh, it's, it's somewhat effective, but it also means that when it comes time for your pump to turn on, it takes a little longer than maybe necessary to come on. So you lose pressure when it comes time, turn, when it's time for it to go off. The pressure may build higher than you want to because again, you've got what's called a delay timer in there. So I talked a little bit about go about a soft starter. So a soft starter is a device that starts and stops a pump by ramping it up and down slower than full speed. So if we were to go back to the earlier scenario, the pressure drops in the main line, that, that, motor, that pump starts, but it ramps up slowly. And then when, you know, when the pressure reaches a certain point, it ramps down slowly. This, if this is easier on the pump. It's easier on the pipes and fittings out in the field does not modulate operating speed. As soon as, as soon as it ramps up to full speed, it continues to ramp its full speed. And the only, um, you know, the only other operational option that you have is that the pump, when, when uh, demand reaches, or when pressure reaches a certain point, it's going to ramp back down and stop. So a pump must be designed to, to supply the maximum possible demand. And we know in, in the irrigation industry, as well as in the water, you know, the potable water delivery industry, that there's going to be typically going to be varied, variable demand out in the field. So in this particular scenario, we have three zones out there. Uh, any one of them could run at once or they could all, in, in this particular case, they could all run at one time. If they all run at one time, then we have to design this pump around 50 gallons a minute at 50 PSI. So we remember we have when pumps are designed, they're designed for particular applications and particular flow ranges. In this application, this is our pump. Here's our maximum demand right here, 50 gallons a minute at 50 PSI. If all those zones come on at once, then that pump starts very quickly and forces all of the water that it has into the system. If there's air in the system, then we get, we go, we're going to get pressure spikes, but in many cases, we're also going to get water hammer. Water hammer means that when the, that air hits the end of whatever pipe, then, it's, then, the, then the air is going to compress and, exp compress and expand and send another shock wave back through the system. What if only one zone starts with this same pump? What happens then is 
not only do we get water hammer, but we're also over pressure. Remember, we needed to operate at 50 PSI. This is a constant speed pump. It only has one speed. It has all or nothing. So in, in, in this particular application, the 10 gallon a minute zone was the only thing that started, which caused the pump to start. We got our water hammer and we're significantly over pressure. Now we're gonna watch variable speed control and how that works. As the 10 gallon a minute zone comes on, it ramps up slowly. Now to 25 gallons a minute. And now to 50 gallons a minute. All that happens automatically. And ra again, rather than seeing a curve here with, pre with uh, uh, pressures varying it would, based on demand, what we see is known as the variable speed curve, which means it's not curved at all. It's a straight line. We're maintaining that 50 PSI across the entire flow range. I'm only showing three flow ranges here right now, but the reality is that it, there's, it's from one gallon a minute all the way through 50 at all points in between when you use a variable frequency drive. Now, as the zones start to turn off, the operation happens in exactly the opposite. So now the pump slows down, slows down as demand decreases and then eventually it puts the pump to what we call sleep, meaning the pump is turned off and it's waiting for something to, for pressure changes to happen in the main line and then it will turn back on again. Another thing that's important to note about variable speed systems that are, are based on pressure demand is that it keeps your main line pressurized at your operating pressure all the time, whether the demand is static or not. Now, a lot of people will be concerned about that because they say, well, we don't want pressure in there because of leakage, et cetera. Uh, but the reality is, in most cases, it's better to keep your main line pressurized all the time than it is to have dramatic uh, fluctuations in pressure because there's some expansion and contraction that goes on in the pipe and at the joints and fittings. Um, and also, of course, as we saw earlier, there's uh, water hammer and pressure issues. We, we do got a couple questions here, Rob, real quick. So one here is, what is a pressure set point, inlet pressure and discharge pressure, and how are they related? Okay, so if, if, if you're talking about, so, so a, set, a pressure set point with a, uh, with a pump system, particularly a pump's automated pump system, is the set point uh, is, is where we have programmed the pump station to operate, okay? So in, in, our, in our previous examples, we wanted that pump station to always maintain 50 PSI. Now it could be anything, whatever it is for any particular application. So that's our, our pressure set point. So the output of the pump is designed to only provide 50 PSI no matter what happens into the system, okay? Now you're talking about the inlet pressure set point. Now that's typically going to be a booster system where we have some kind of pressurized water entering the pump. The pump is actually adding pressure to it before it sends it out into the system in order to have enough pressure for whatever devices are being operated out there. Not very often um, do we see a set point there. We're going to be receiving whatever the other, um, you know, whatever's providing the other pressure, uh, pumps or something else at another location or going to whatever pressure they're providing to that pump is how is our pumps going to take that and then increase it accordingly. So uh, I, I'm not sure that I can think of a good example of where we would have an inlet pressure set point. So the variable pump speed will only increase as demand is needed, not at a certain time or a scheduled time. Well, I mean, you know, you can do a lot of things with, uh, with, with variable frequency drives and, and, and modern technology. I, I can't think of an application where there would be a set time where, where pressure would increase. So we're going to, you know, in, in the simplest of applications, you're going to see what we just saw, which is we've set that pressure to be maintained 50 PSI, no matter what happens in the field. It's sensing pressure that's in the main line. And whenever that changes, it reacts accordingly. It turns the pump on ramps it up, ramps it down, turns it off, whatever is necessary. Uh, I, ca I can't think right now of an application where you would do that on some sort of a timed interval or, or anything else, uh, but not to say that it can't be done, but I'm, I'm not sure what type of application that would be used for. One of the things that you can do with VFDs is you can have multiple pressure set points. So if, for example, you have some zones and whatever your project is that are at maybe 
uh, various altitudes or possibly, you know, much further away from one than the other, where you might need an increase in pressure for the one that's farthest away or the one at the highest altitude. If there's, if you can feed some information back to the pump station control system that lets it know which zone is operating, you can actually set most, multiple pressure po set points so that we know that that high zone over there needs another 10 PSI. So when it's operating, it will operate at a higher pressure. There's one more that just came in. So if okay. there's a leak main line, will the pump be cycling uh, on and off? Yeah, and that's that's a good question, and and it's very good possibility that it will. So um, if there, it, you know, there's there are very few main lines that I've seen out there um, in the irrigation industry that don't have at least a little bit of leakage. Pretty common, uh, and so yes, there is a possibility for there to be uh, for the pump to cycle. When you run into that, app, you know that that situation, there are a lot of things that you have to consider. So one of the things I think that we want to that you might consider in that case is using the pump start relay, even though it's a variable speed pressure actuated system. Oftentimes, and 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 in the systems that we build, you can you can it's user selectable. It can either be totally pressure start stop, or you can actually have uh, a, a pump start relay that starts and stops. So what the pump start relay would do in that application is when there are no zones running, we know there's going to be a lot of leakage out there and we don't want the pump to operate. So in that case, it's go going to put the pump to sleep until, until there's some irrigation going on out there. That will eliminate a lot of the leakage. The other thing that can be done is, it, you know, we have worked on applications where there are old, very large piping networks and, you know, there's the leakage is there and there's nothing that can be done about it. And so in that case, we may add a pressure maintenance pump or what's known as a jockey pump in some cases. Jockey pump will handle, uh, you know, any low flow applications that you have, but also uh, maintain pressure in the system to overcome the leakage. Now, finally, uh, you know, when you're using variable frequency drives and you have that application, uh, you keep keep in mind that, you, you know, the when there is leakage out there, that the pump's going to ramp up slowly and ramp down slowly. So you're not going to get the, the short cycling. You can program in timing as well. And then, um, you know, we also will sometimes add a function. Well, we always add a function, but it's user selectable where the system goes to sleep on based on whatever flow is. So we know at a certain low flow range that that's our leakage that we're trying to overcome and it just puts the pump to sleep. So VFD, we all, we all, I, I think hear that term a lot, VFD, variable frequency drive, sometimes known as variable speed drive. Um, a VFD is just a device, a computer really, that automatically starts, stops, and vary the, varies the speed of a pump motor to regulate output. And in fact, it starts and stops and regulates the speed of all kinds of motors for all kinds of application and not just pumps. So the only way that the VFD knows what to do and when to do it is it has to have some sort of an input. In irrigation applications, that is typ typically what's known as a pressure transducer. So on the discharge of the pump station, somewhere in the main line, we have a device called a pressure transducer and that's constantly sensing pressure and it's sending that information back to the VFD and the VFD will then sleep, start, ramp up, ramp down accordingly to maintain whatever the set pressure is. We want to do again, and we've looked at this a few times, is we want to maintain a constant pressure across the entire flow range. It's very typical in irrigation applications. It's going to be the most common um, uh, use of a VFD in irrigation is to maintain constant pressure. I put magnetic flow meter in here because you can also control a VFD with flow meters. Not very common in, in, in uh, most things that we're going to see in irrigation, but it senses flow changes and signals the VFD to vary speed. In this case, we want to maintain a constant flow and uh, at varying pressures. Why would you want to do that? Well, in some cases, maybe you're transferring water to a tank or something, and you need to move that water at a specific rate in order to maybe avoid overflowing your pond or whatever you're doing. But as it pumps into the tank or the, or the pond that's above it, um, there's a possibility that the head pressure as it's pumping water in there, as, as the pond or the tank is filling, is, is pushing pressure back on the pump, which means that the output of the pump, because of uh, the pressure is, is increasing, the output of the pump is decreasing. Now, if we wanted to make sure that we have to move X amount of water no matter what, then we would use a flow meter and say, no matter what happened with, what, what's happening with the pressure, maintain this set flow rate. 
change flow output put based on variable demand, varying demand. This oftentimes used in large water features. Uh, sometimes, you know, they, they'll they'll put timers on water features. So at various times of the day, they will change the output, you know, primarily due to aesthetics, but to save some energy, et cetera. And then we have what's called a level transducer. If we get back to, uh, um, if we get back to the, the tank fill, et cetera, um, senses pressure changes due to level changes and signals the VFD to vary speed to maintain a constant level. So if you need to keep your tank at a specific level, then, and, and you know, we don't want to go, when it drops down to here, start, when it gets up here, fill it up. If we, if we don't, if we want to maintain this level at all times, we use a device which, that's called a level transducer, which just is in the bottom of your tank or whatever it is, senses pressure, essentially the head pressure that's over the top of it, and it speeds up, slows down the pump in order to maintain that level. Again, not super common in the irrigation industry. So as you can see with modern pump systems, there's a lot going on. Uh, if, you, if we were to rely on you know, manual adjustments and manual reaction to all of this, it would be very hard to do it very efficiently or effectively. So in the old days, they would do their very best using what are known what are known as relay banks. And I'm sure if you're all looking at that, you fully understand what we're seeing and how it's wired and, and how it works. Um, I'm, I'm glad you do, because I don't. Uh, and then, so when something happens, a relay makes something else happen. And when that happens, maybe another relay makes something else happen. And it's a lot of switching that goes on and um, very complicated. And then, of course, I talked to you about timers inside the panel. Well, now we, if, if, those re, if you need some kind of delays, et cetera, on those relays, then you put what's called a, a, a delay timer, an on delay timer, an off delay timer. Also, typically located inside the panel, also located in a place where if you want to make adjustments, your adjustments, you're likely to electrocute yourself. And then lots of mechanical switches were used. This is a mechanical pressure switch. So if you you can set your pressure ranges on there, comes on, goes off, uh, shut your pump down if it reaches too high a pressure, shut your pump down if it reaches too low a pressure. And then back in the good old days, if you looked at a pump panel, it oftentimes looked a lot like this. If you wanted to make changes, if you wanted to make adjustments as the end user, you had to go in here and you had to change this and then you had to change that associated thing, et cetera, and so on. And when you got all done, you didn't like what you did and good luck trying to remember what you did and reversing what you you know have done. The, the end result typically when you see this is the end user doesn't touch the thing no matter what's happening. Is it common to use pressure tanks in combination with a VFD to minimize cycling? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's application dependent, Steve, for sure. It's, uh, um, if for some reason there's just no, you know, there's just no good solution, then a pressure tank can do that for sure. And I think that actually maybe I've, I've worked with Steve on projects and I think we've probably, uh, uh, used pressure tanks in some of those applications. So yes, uh, if, if, if there's just no good solution to overcoming leakage or, or low flow situations, and you just want to, you, you want to buy some time essentially between the time that the company pump comes on and goes off, then pressure tanks are definitely used use in those applications. It's a modern control panel rather than all of the uh, switches and, and relays and timers, et cetera, and so on. Um, you know, we've got the VFDs, got the programmable logic controller. We're about to talk about that. And then in, mo in most modern, in a lot of modern systems, we are have the ability to remote control and monitor. Um, and in this particular application, we're using a cellular modem so that, the, so that the system can be, anything that can be done locally on this system can be done via the cloud on any internet connected device. If, for, if you have, you know, if you don't have internet at the pump site, you can use cellular modems. You can also use, if you have an ethernet connection available, you can just plug the system into the internet. More importantly, we have the HMI touch screen over here. Rather than all the button switches, et cetera, and so on that we saw there, everything in a modern pumping system takes place in a very easy to use, very intuitive HMI touch screen. What's behind the HMI touch screen is what's, the screen is what's known as a programmable logic controller. That's the onboard computer that controls all system functions, okay? computer. So this would be a typical display on a pump station here. And um, I'm going to show you a few of the operations that go on and how they work. 
So pressure, pressure is really one of the most important things that we that uh, that we deal with in irrigation, and it's the one that is most often adjusted. With this particular touch screen, you press the pressure button. You go in here, you change your pressure set point to whatever you want it to be. Now remember, we also have uh, alarms and faults in here in case the pressure goes too high or too low. We want the system to shut down so it's not damaged. There almost inevitably, when you make one change on a pump system, there are associated changes that need to be made. In this case, we want to have a low pressure limit that will give us an alarm or a shutdown. And then we may want to delay when that happens just so that we don't have what are called nuisance trips. And then we also have high pressure um, uh, uh, shutdowns. And, and then pressure maximum, meaning that if for some reason this system has reached this pressure maximum, shut everything down. Next is our flow. So we can monitor our flow we can, um, and we can make uh, uh, changes to the system so that, so that we can uh, control flow so that we don't get uh, high flow or low flow problems. And again, we can make all those adjustments with the touch of a button or the, the, um, and the adding of a value. Okay, now we have, our, we have all of our pump status all available right here. It's not a light, a green light, a red light, or whatever, flashing light. It's actually, you can see the status. You can see the speed that the pump is running. You can speed the, see the amperage being used by the pump. And then we can go into additional settings here, and we can, um, we can set minimum, maximums, et cetera, in there so that we can control the output of that pump via the VFD. If you were to have a filter system on, on your pump station, all of the controls of the filter system are also available through the touch screen. Anything that you need to do with that filter system, you can do here rather than at a separate device. And, and the value to that is you can also um, uh, incorporate that into your remote control and monitoring system. Fault logs. Fault logs are really important. Fault logs are the, one of the most important things that you have for troubleshooting. You can look at, 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 at fault logs and you can see a trend and it helps you to understand what might be going on there. Um, and the other thing that if you, if you happen to see a lot of, of uh, voltage issues and you go to your power company and say, you know, we're having a lot of low voltage issues, they're going to say, no, we never have problems with our system. And then you take the fault log and you say, yeah, except for every day at you know, 12.30 PM, you have low voltage and suddenly they have problems with their system and they fix them. Okay, trend logs. We can put a lot of trend logging in here, pressure flow, uh, various other things, and you can monitor that. You can download that, and you can use that data for whatever might be important to you. And then this is this is the menu of of the many things that can be done with this with this PLC done easily and and easy to understand. And if you happen to be controlling level, as I showed you earlier, we, you know we can also incorporate that in there as well, and you can and you can enter those settings. Point being is there's a lot that can be done here. There's a lot of performance that can be done. It's easy to do. It walks you through every step that needs to be done. And really importantly is there's a default button on this. So at the end of the day, if you don't like what you just did, you can go back to where you started. So there again are all of the, all of the functionality that we just talked about. And there's a lot more available to you with, uh, with PLCs on a, on a pump station. Can you adjust these settings remotely utilizing the cell comp? You can, and we're, we're going to get to that, Andy. Um, you can anything that you can do locally here. If you're utilizing the remote control and monitoring system, the cloud-based system, anything that you can do uh, uh, locally can be done remotely. So uh, I'm assuming there's some kind of printout capability remotely then as well. Uh, yeah, good question. I'm not sure I can answer that. Is there password protection? Yes, there's absolutely password protection. So if you have a if you have somebody uh, out in the field who likes to mess with things and you don't want them messing with it, you can password protect this, and they cannot have access to it. Do most VFD controls allow for a ramp up period that is adjustable to keep yeah. the pump from reaching full RPMs for a certain time period? Uh, slow fill of the lines. Uh, yeah, so 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 that's a, a two prong question. Yes, the ramp speed is fully adjustable, both up and down. Um, and then, as far as filling of the lines go, uh, our systems and most systems have a line fill routine programmed into it. So if uh, so, when you start the system up originally, or if there's a power failure or something, and all the pumps turn off and the system and, and pressure drains down in the main line significantly, when the system comes back on again. 
you know, without without that without that routine in there, without those settings, if the pressure in that system had dropped to zero, every pump in the system and it will ramp up, but it will ramp up pretty quickly and it's going to force water into that system very quickly. So we have a ramp up routine when the uh, when a mainline fill routine, which is going to very slowly, uh, it's going to monitor pressure and very slowly uh, increase the pressure in that line so that you can slowly move the air out of the system. Does each pump motor have a separate VFD when you have multiple pumps on the system or does a single VFD control all motors? can be done either way. Um, in most irrigation applications, you're, uh, you're going to see our systems include, are going to include two, let's, let's assume we have three 50 horsepower pumps and one five horsepower pressure maintenance slash jockey pump. We will have, in most irrigation systems, we'll have one 50 horsepower VFD. All, all of the uh, 50 horsepower motors operate under the control of that VFD not necessarily under the control. I'll explain that in a second. And then the jockey pump, pressure maintenance pump, will also have a VFD uh, that's primarily to el eliminate short cycling, et cetera. Now, what happens when you use a VFD on multiple, one single VFD on multiple pumps, the common way of doing that and the industry standard is that the, the first pump starts, the jockey pump reaches full capacity. Now it's time for the first 50 horsepower to pump, pump to start. That pump will start and ramp to whatever the you know demand is. It'll ramp up, up, up as demand increases. And then when it exceeds, when the demand increases, the, uh, increases beyond the capacity of that pump, then it will see that and it will turn on the second pump. It will start full speed, but the VFD is programmed to ramp down simultaneously and slowly so that you, will not, you won't see any real pressure increases. In fact, none to speak of. So that, ne so that next pump or what we call the lag motor will come on. Um, and you know, it, 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 then the VFD pump ramps back down and then it ramps up, up, up until it reaches full capacity, starts the next pump in the same process. Um, and can do that essentially forever. And then, of course, as, the, as, as pressure decreases, then it happens in reverse order. It's, it's the industry standard in irrigation, and it works very well that way. Uh, I would, in most applications, when somebody asks me, do I need multiple VFDs in this application, I would probably say, I don't think you're going to get your money, money's worth. We do, a lot of, we do a lot of systems that have multiple VFDs. I can tell you they're extremely smoothly operating systems. Uh, I just don't know that you get uh, you get your money's worth at the end of the gate end of the day in most uh, irrigation applications. So yes, it can be done both ways. So a lot of uh, 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 people will try to use the VFD for all of the controls on a pump system, and a lot of the a lot of the functionality can be done through the VFD. Just want to show you the instructions for changing your high pressure setting with a VFD. Here are the instructions for the same adjustment using a PLC. Press this, press this, change value. So as you can see, it's significantly more intuitive, obviously, and significantly easier to run everything through the, through the programmable logic controller for the end user. Remote control and monitoring, we just discussed that a little bit. If you have remote control and monitoring available, again, everything that you can do uh, locally on a pump station can be done remotely via a computer, laptop, cell phone, whatever. We, uh, yeah, in many cases, that, that single pump station is the IP address. That's the only thing that you can access. We can also create a dashboard. Dashboards are created by a lot of manufacturers so that you can monitor multiple sites and control multiple sites by clicking on that dashboard. Now here's the real, uh, I, I think one of the most important um, advantages to utilizing the remote control and monitoring system. And we, we run into this on a regular basis remote troubleshooting, tech support, and programming from the factory. So if, if, if uh, sorry, if, a, uh, if one of our users is having problems, they call us, we can go into their system, we can do the troubleshooting, we can give them tech support, help them make um, whatever changes they might want to make. And if programming changes or patches need to be made, we can do that remotely. In, in most cases, that's completely no cost and it happens very quickly. 
rather than having to call a technician out there, the technician has to troubleshoot, go through it. And then, you know, if the warranty's up, they're charging you for all of that. And then when they get done, then they have to, you know, solve the problem at a bare minimum. If, if we, if we go in and do some troubleshooting and realize that, that, that a technician needs to arrive on site, we will already know what the problem is. We will know if there are parts or whatever that need to be replaced or repaired, what those are so that when the tech arrives, he's ready to solve the problem. And if there's a cost associated with it, the cost is minimal. Minimal. I'm going to go through this very quickly, but I just want to kind of expand on uh, on the integration of automation and and you know what's the way that's done uh, in the modern era is usually with a package system, so that all of that is done in, in a factory. And uh, in a factory, you have a lot of experts who not only experts in the mechanical end of things, but experts with uh, automation as well. They marry all of that together, and uh, when they ship it to you, it's been tested and it's been built by experts and most importantly at the end of the day if you have a problem there's only one person to call or there's only one point of contact whoever built your pump station so this is a project that we're doing uh, and this is going to be going on multiple agricultural sites and each one of these pump systems is going to provide water to multiple farmers ultimately there are going to be multiples of these pump stations out there so we did talk about vertical turbine pumps i just wanted to show you that there are the vertical turbine pumps there vertical turbine pumps there and we have a submersible turbine jockey pump pressure maintenance pump in this case which is located right there we have a bank of sand media filters here most commonly used in, irrig in, in agricultural irrigation, very good method of removing suspended, fine suspended solids, uh, not commonly used in most other irrigation applications. And we also have some suction, in this particular application, we have some suction scanner filters on the downstream side of the sand media filters where they're going to filter to an even finer degree. Everything that you see there and then some is being controlled by a single control panel. In this case, it's going to be outdoors, it's going to be in a hot climate, so that control panel is air conditioned. Everything that you see there will be fully tested before it leaves the facility. When it gets there, you hook up your pipes, you put the power to it, you go through a startup routine and off you go. One of the things that I did want to bring up is we have with that particular system and that organization, they wanted to be able to uh, manage their water usage. And I'm not going to read all of the bullet points here. So it includes a water management system. They're actually going to have, because again, it's, it's uh, agriculture. There's a lot of scrutiny over the water being used there. They're going to be able to monitor and um and collect data on, on all of the water that's being used, et cetera, when it's being used. And when there are significant rain events, et cetera, there's actually the ability to shut the pump system down. Again, we have multiple users out there. And some sometimes, as, as you know, when you drive through any given subdivision, it doesn't matter if it's raining or not, the water's flowing. So this, if you shut the water down at the source, then there's just no way that that's going to happen. And then of course, th this system provides for some very significant, um, uh, data gathering and reporting, which will, in these cases, be provided to a number of different entities who provide the water. Automatic suction scanners, I don't want to uh, take too much time on this, but essentially it's the most modern method of filtering water and what it uses, what automatic suction scanners do is water collects on the inside of the screen and then there are devices called suction scanners that periodically based on pressure differential will suck that material off and flush it to waste. Some examples of, of irrigation systems with uh, uh, automatic suction scanner filters on them. Vertical turbine pump station, just an example of what the, you know, the underside of a vertical turbine pump station looks like. And then in this case, we have a submersible pump station. So water recapture systems, another way to, uh, another way that uh, technology and integration is done. And integrated buildings and enclosures. So it's becoming more and more uh, common for uh, end users and to want to use an entirely integrated building. In that case, all of the automation that's associated with, uh, with the pump station is integrated into, uh, um, into, into the system that we deliver or, or anybody in our industry that delivers to the site. This particular application, um, integration of peripheral devices, Oftentimes the pump station will have the automation built into it to control other items out in the field. The problem is we've fully tested our system and when it arrives at the on site, those peripheral devices still haven't been tested by integrating. In this case, we integrated a, a backup generator. 
by integrating that at the factory, it's fully tested when it arrives. We don't have to deal with any issues when it arrives on site. And that's it. Best wishes for 2021 and thank you for joining. Or with permission settings available for the controller, can you get notified when changes are made and of who made them? Uh, yeah, you can. So um, I, I don't know if every system that we build has that capability, but we, but we do have that capability available and I'm certain that uh, everybody in the industry does as well. Do those sand filters have a backwash cycle automatically running in backwash mode off of pressure readings? Yeah, so the sand filters, uh, in most cases, uh, they do have pressure differential readings. And in most cases, uh, they're designed to, uh, it, so, so each pod will uh, flush individually and they will flush in sequence because if you clean one, then, you know, waterfall is a path of least resistance. It's going to continue to flow through that one while the others are, are plugged up. A majority of the time, what I see with sand media filters is they're actually yeah, and, and again, we can, uh, it's user selectable. They're done on timed intervals. So it can be done either way. Can you remind everyone of your name and how they should contact with you for further questions? Well, thank you. Yeah, my name is Rob Aldinger. Um, I'm with Precision Pumping Systems out of Boise, Idaho. I can be reached uh, at my email address, which is rob at g-o-p-p-s dot u-s or our phone number is 208-631-8082. Can different manufactured pump stations be linked to lake fill pumps? Well, linking of, uh, uh, linking of, I don't know that it's so much to do with manufacturers, uh, linking to any Peripheral devices typically has more to do with uh, just the communication between the two devices and, and what types of devices are being used. So I guess the short answer to that is yes.